So, okay, uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, present you something on the formalization efforts of, of the formalization efforts of the artisanal mining uh, sector in Eastern DRC. So, um, I'm Ken Matthijsen and I'm working for uh, the International Peace Information Service, um, which is a Belgian-based uh, research institute that does research on conflict motives in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And so today I will tell you something about, like I said, the formalization effort uh, of artisanal mining in Eastern DRC and the, the main driving force behind it, which is uh, the conflict minerals issue. So, um, first of all, I will give you some more info on the artisanal mining sector in, uh, in the Congo. So, um, for the moment, uh, mining in Eastern DRC is almost entirely done through artisanal mining. Industrial mining has almost completely disappeared um, during the 1990s uh, for, for several reasons, but yeah, I've listed the, the most important one, ones here. Uh, so there's uh, Mobutu's devastating economic rule. Uh, you have the, um, the collapse of mineral prices um, at the world market at the end of the 1980s. And there's, of course, the, the Congolese wars um, in, the, in the 1990s. Then, um, there, yeah, there's many things to say about the artisanal mining sector uh, in Eastern DRC. But for the sake of time, I've just selected um, the, the two most relevant uh, characteristics for this presentation, which is, first of all, that the artisanal mining sector in Eastern DRC is yeah, it's very informal. There are hardly any um, miners that are officially uh, registered. But uh, this does not mean, however, that, um, that the sector is completely chaotic. Uh, the sector is very well structured indeed. So there are about, um, yeah, the estimate is 500,000 to 2 million miners that are uh, working in the mines uh, in the Congo. And um, they dig the, the, the minerals, they exploit the minerals with a lot of manpower and very rudimentary tools. Next, they sell their production to local traders who transport the minerals from the remote mining sites to uh, trading towns next to the eastern uh, Congolese border, from where uh, export houses export minerals to the world market. So, then the, the second... Um, important uh, characteristic is the fact that um, artisanal mining has become a very important uh, livelihood strategy for many people in Eastern DRC. Um, there's an estimate that 10 to 12 million people depend directly or indirectly uh, on artisanal mining uh, for their income. When I say indirectly, it means, for example, uh, dependents of the miners or uh, shopkeepers at the mining sites uh, or any other business which is, in, uh, which is linked to the mining sector. So, um, the, the, the fact uh, that the state is hardly present in the eastern part of the country and the fact that, um, that the artisanal mining sector is, ha is highly informal makes it very vulnerable to, um, to, to armed groups because indeed um, Minerals are an important source of revenues, if not the most important source of revenues for many armed groups in Eastern DRC. And when we're talking about armed groups, we're talking about uh, rebellions, as well as uh, units of the, of the National Army. Um, but, uh, so as such, minerals do play uh, a very important role in the prolongation of insecurity and conflict in Eastern DRC. But it's, it's very important to underline that these, that these minerals are definitely not the cause of the, of the conflict. And, and this is very important, uh, a very important remark, because um, with, with the heightened attention uh, at the scene of the international community uh, over the last years, there have been many rashly executed um, conflict analysis, um, which do see a quite direct link between mineral exploitation and conflict. And uh, yeah, this analysis is, is quite problematic. And I will come back to this later on. Um, so with a, with a heightened attention for the conflict minerals issue in Eastern DRC, um, there, have been many, there has been a, a bigger push to formalize uh, the artisanal mining sector. 
Um, in the past, there have already been other uh, formalization efforts. So one by the, by the national government. Yeah, although we do have to say that it's not really an effort. It was foreseen in the Congolese Mining Code, which was created in cooperation with the World Bank in, uh, in 2002. But uh, this has had very little effect on the ground because, first of all, there's very little incentive for miners to formalize. Uh, in their point of view, they don't get anything in return uh, to register. In their point of view, it's just to pay extra taxes. Because, uh, yeah, just one example is that um, registered miners have very little uh, security of tenure. If the, the state deems uh, an artisanal mining site viable for industrial exploitation, it can chase the miners away within, sec within 60 days. Um, furthermore, also traders or exporters have very little incentive to go formal because export taxes are much lower, uh, for min export taxes for minerals are much lower um, in the eastern neighboring countries. And third of all, also actually there's very little political will of the, of the national government to nationalize, uh, to, to formalize the artisanal mining sector, as they are much more interested in industrial mining. Um, so the consequence is that uh, a lot of the, the minerals leave Eastern DRC uh, illegally or informally. Um, oh yeah, I forgot to tell, uh, just a quick note, that when we're talking about um, this artisanal mining sector in Eastern Congo, uh, it involves mainly gold and uh, the three T minerals, uh, like Louis already mentioned, which is tin, tungsten, and tantalum. Um, so, like I said, um, this heightened attention uh, within the international community for the conflict minerals issue has created a bigger push and has created um, has created a bigger push for the formalization and and uh, the increase of transparency in the Congolese artisanal mining sector. Uh, many initiatives have been created over the last five years and um, yeah, I think that the, the three main categories of, um, of initiatives that have been created are due diligence initiatives, traceability initiatives and certification mechanisms. Uh, yeah, for the sake of time, it isn't possible to explain uh, what these initiatives exactly are because it's quite technical. And also, I guess for this, yeah, for this presentation, it isn't really essential. So um, we will go quickly to the effects of these initiatives. Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, it's very difficult to assess the effect of, of one individual um, initiative because a wide array of initiatives have been implemented at the same time. So it's very difficult to link one effect to one initiative. But um, yeah, in general, we can see that uh, the consequences have been quite mixed and, and, and rather negative. Although one positive consequence has been that um, conflict fina financing um, by minerals has indeed uh, decreased in, in, in 3T mining areas, so the tin, tantalum and tungsten mining areas. But um, the negative effects uh, were also quite harsh. And the first one is um, that there has been uh, a de facto embargo against Congolese minerals. Um, because um, companies on the international market are afraid of reputational damage, they, they shy away from the Congo and they prefer to source their minerals from other areas um, in the world or on the world market. So the effect is that the legal tin trade in the Congo has completely collapsed over the last years. And, um, this, of course, had had some, quite some negative consequences for the livelihoods of many artisanal miners. Their income decreased, um, consumer goods became scarce in remote mining areas. And yeah, this, of course, had, has had quite some negative effects on, on schooling, on healthcare, on the level of criminality. Um, so uh, this brings me to the, to the lessons learned. Um, yeah, it's just a few. I guess there's much more, but in our point of view, these are the, the most important ones. So first of all, um, yeah, the first one is not really linked to formalization, but it is a very important one, is that there's more to security than conflict minerals. Uh, a lot of the initiatives are linked to a narrow, um, com yeah, a, a, a narrow conflict minerals discourse. Uh, like I mentioned before, you have this rashly executed um, 
conflict analysis, which, uh, which sees a quite direct link between mineral exploitation and conflict. So um, the consequence is that some policymakers create policies that really focus on conflict minerals to solve the conflict. But yeah, this doesn't work, uh, and, and a more holistic approach is needed. Uh, uh, approach which includes the conflict minerals discourse, but also, for example, uh, security sector reform, um, the refugee problem in, uh, in the area, uh, corruption, yeah, and yeah, I can go on and on uh, on other causes of the conflict. Um, so the second uh, lesson learned is that there is more to artisanal mining than conflict. Um, it's very important um, that. Um, that initiatives do not limit themselves to just bashing the conflict minerals issue, because um, the, the, the danger is uh, we should be very careful not to criminalize the entire sector with focusing too much on this, on this conflict minerals issue, because it is such an important livelihood for so many people um, in the country, even though conflict is, is involved. Um, therefore, it's important also that something which is linked to this, that formalization efforts um, do not just focus on conflict minerals, but also take into account other issues, like for example environmental issues or, or the bad working conditions that are currently uh, seen at the mining sites, um, because this is often lacking uh, currently in a lot of the initiatives that are being implemented. Um, a third issue is the, is the top-down approach. A lot of the initiatives that have been created uh, are created in, in, in Brussels, London or New York and they use a strong top-down approach. And uh, yeah, this is quite problematic because if uh, these initiatives make a lot of demands on, on all kinds of actors in the Congolese mining sector, then these initiatives should also make sure that uh, in addition they, they, um, they try to, s to stimulate a formalization effort uh, from below. So, because for the moment, um, if we visit the field, we see that hardly any of the local actors know any of the initiatives that affect their business. So it's really important that um, in the future there is more attention uh, to stimulate local actors uh, to work formal and to give them an, in an incentive to work formal. Um, because just just giving them rules uh, won't do it. Then, um, yeah. So if we want to uh, to st really stimulate uh, artisanal miners to work formally, and if we want um, to implement a formalization uh, mechanism or formalization strategy that is driven from below, um, it is important that there is uh, more attention for capacity building of local state agencies. Because for the moment. This is really, yeah, their capacity is really terrible. Uh, they do not have the capacity to implement any initiative, uh, or at least on, on a large scale. Um, and this brings me to the last uh, issue, and it is that um, the initiatives uh, should go beyond just making demands of, on industry, because we see that for the moment the only initiatives um, that have been that, that are quite far in their implementation phase are initiatives that make demands on the industry, and um, this once again is quite problematic because if you make too many demands on industry without um, uh, without a progress from other actors uh, in the sector, uh, there's a big risk that companies either shy away from the region, which happens right now. Uh, because it's too difficult uh, for them to prove that they're buying clean minerals. And second of all, uh, another risk is that they, that they um, more or less uh, twist um, the original objectives that were behind uh, the, the formalization initiatives or the, or the conflict mineral initiatives. Um, yeah, to explain this, to make this a bit clearer, the problem, uh, the risk is that when initiatives focus too much on supply chains of, uh, of companies, there is a risk that um, this supply chain becomes the, more Im the most important thing and that a clean supply chain becomes a name in itself. So the consequence is that we, we even now see some initiatives 
where companies really focus on creating a clean supply chain, so they just buy from one mining, uh, from one mining site that is clean, this, this, this walled community or this island of, of security, of good working conditions, but they neglect um, the situation around the mining site. And of course, this is not the original objective um, behind the formalization and, and, and anti-conflict mineral uh, strategy. Um, okay, thank you very much for your attention. This was more or less my, uh, my presentation. Of course, if there are any questions, then I will be very happy to, 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 to reply to them afterwards.